Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Israel and Hamas have approved a ceasefire after 11 days of intense fighting in Gaza. The ceasefire is set to begin early Friday morning. It comes after another barrage of Hamas rockets and Israeli airstrikes. In total, at least 12 Israelis and 230 Palestinians have died. Many of the victims are children. The White House has been working with regional partners to end the violence, holding over 80 engagements with senior leaders on the matter. President Biden spoke with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi on Thursday. That call was just hours before the warring sides accepted a truce proposed by Egypt. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, the House narrowly passed a supplemental spending bill worth nearly $2 billion to strengthen security at the U.S. Capitol. The vote passed 213 to 212, with all Republicans voting against it. It comes a day after the House passed a different measure that would create an independent commission to investigate the January 6th Capitol riot. The bill faces an uphill battle in the Senate. And following a surge of violence against Asian Americans during the pandemic, President Biden has signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law. It aims to expedite the review of hate crime incidents and fund better record keeping. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris praised the bipartisan legislation Thursday. Racism exists in America. Xenophobia exists in America. Anti-Semitism. Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, it all exists. And so the work to address injustice wherever it exists remains the work ahead. My message to all of those of you who are hurting is we see you. And the Congress has said we see you. And we are committed to stop the hatred and the bias. For more, let's bring in Nancy Cordes, Jacqueline Alemany, and Anita Kumar. Nancy is CBS News Chief White House Correspondent. Jackie is a congressional correspondent for The Washington Post and author of their Power Up newsletter. And Anita is White House Correspondent and Associate Editor at Politico. Welcome to you all. Uh, Anita, what can you tell us about this ceasefire coming and the way in which uh, it happened? What do we know about the U.S.'s involvement specifically regarding this deal? Well, as the White House has been telling us that they have been involved uh, uh, primarily behind the scenes, quiet diplomacy is, is what they like to say, that they've had a number of calls, dozens of calls uh, with leaders between U.S. officials and, and various uh, people in the in the area. Uh, we've seen readouts of several of those calls. The president has spoken to the prime minister uh, four times in recent days, more than I believe he's spoken to any other world leader. And you saw that last call being pretty forceful uh, with the president talking about how something needed to happen and this, this violence needed to come to an end. So his language has gotten uh, over the last week or so, or a couple weeks, has gotten more forceful as the United States has tried uh, you know, to broker a deal here. But, you know, he's been facing some criticism, uh, President Biden has, for not doing enough, for not uh, having this on his radar. It's not something he was really talking about. He wasn't speaking about the Middle East early on, uh, but also for not doing a lot enough in the last couple weeks and letting others uh, take a greater role, including Egypt. Jackie, up to Anita's point here, how much pressure was President Biden facing over this conflict? We know there were concerns raised in Congress over a planned arms sale between the U.S. and Israel. Progressives in particular had been pretty uh, vocal about trying to stop that. Um, what's the latest on that and how much pressure was the president facing here? The president was facing quite a bit of pressure, and not just from those progressive Democrats who you saw put their name on these two resolutions that were introduced in the House and then this morning by Bernie Sanders in the Senate, but also from even some staunch defenders of Israel, like Senator Bob Menendez, who really for the first time in Ward? his career put uh, a statement of condemnation on Saturday after the bombing of the building housing the Associated Press, Al Jazeera, and other media outlets. Uh, you know, saying that it was important to protect the free press. Tony Blinken then said on Monday that the U.S. had not yet seen any evidence to bolster Israel's uh, claims that there, that Hamas was actually operating inside this office building. That caused even more senators, again, some of whom are moderate and uh, even, you know, 
actively pro-Israel um, to come out and, and call for a ceasefire. Biden trailed all of this rhetoric. Um, he has been uh, out of lockstep with the majority of the party, really, even on just calling for a ceasefire, and only did so until criticism and, and pressure escalated. Uh, it all really came to a head, I think, with the first major break that you've seen from progressive, between progressives and Joe Biden uh, this morning and yesterday when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez proceeded to leave. Uh, and then this morning, Bernie Sanders, as you noted, introduced those two resolutions of disapprovals. It's still unclear how the White House is going to proceed. The proposed sale was initially approved, but it could be delayed by the White House. Um, representatives from the White House were actually meeting with members of Congress today with uh, those members on the House Foreign Affairs Committee who have objected to the proposed sale, at least during this very moment. We'll see what uh, ultimately comes out of those conversations. All right. On another topic, Nancy, the spending bill to beef up security at the U.S. Capitol was almost derailed by some progressive members of the Democratic Party. Why? Why is that? The, the two sides are so closely divided in Congress right now. Democrats knew they weren't going to get any Republican support, so they needed to get their entire party to stick together. And at the last minute, this kind of surprise defection from six progressive members who are often referred to as the squad, um, some of them voting no, some of them voting present. So it was a squeaker, 213 to 212, on what Democrats expected would sort of be a, a, a you know, a pro forma vote, at least within their own party, to beef up security at the Capitol. Now, these members who voted no said that they didn't have an issue with improving security at the Capitol. What they had an issue with was, in some cases, um, giving more money to police departments and also not giving enough money to other workers at the Capitol who were affected back on January 6th, custodial staff, janitors, people who work in the cafeterias who were also deeply affected by what happened at the U.S. Capitol. They said that this bill didn't do enough to address some of their concerns. Um, and so they made this statement by voting no or voting present at the last minute. That kind of ticked some Democrats off, even some of their progressive allies who said, um, you know, that they really put the, the party in a bind, made the party look bad, like it didn't have its act together. Um, but uh, clearly, these members of the, the squad saw an opportunity to kind of uh, make their case about something that they cared about, and they took it. Jackie, uh, the fight over face masks is playing out on Capitol Hill, but with stiffer penalties now. Three members of Congress were fined $500 for refusing to wear them. This comes after the CDC relaxed guidelines about vaccinated people wearing them. So why is the rule still in place, and how is the argument being framed? The rule still in place because, as we saw yesterday, um, that vote ultimately failed. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has said that, and she's used uh, the congressional doctor to help bolster her argument that every member should be vaccinated before members are allowed to operate in the House, especially in the House chamber, without their masks. Um, I asked Marjorie Taylor Greene yesterday about whether she had been vaccinated, yet she is uh, one of those potential holdouts. We don't actually know. She responded that I was violating um, her uh, privacy, that I wasn't entitled to that information, and falsely claimed that the vaccine was not safe and FDA and not FDA approved. She wouldn't say whether or not she recommended that her constituents get vaccinated. Um, and I think that the, the this tiny battle taking place in the House right now is really a microcosm for, I think, these conversations and debates that we're going to see take place across the country as we get back into post-pandemic life and sort of navigate the contours of who is vaccinated and who are the holdouts here and how how to trust each other and uh, our communities that people are being truthful and honest about whether they are vaccinated and acting safely. Um, I, you know, it's it. I think it, that debate put a an interesting cap on a week for the Republican Party that has uh, aggressively fought against the January 6th commission, against masks, uh, and ousted Liz Cheney. It's certainly been an uh, exciting or eventful past two weeks. 
Yeah, and, and I think you're right. There are just so many open questions when it comes to navigating our way through the coming months here because of all of those uh, trust questions that you raised um, that Americans certainly are going to be asking. Um, but, Nancy, let's turn to infrastructure, because President Biden had said that he wanted a counterproposal from Republicans by Tuesday. It's now Thursday. Where do things stand on that? Well, uh, the White House did not get an infrastructure proposal back from Republicans, and it doesn't sound like they're actually going to get a complete proposal. Instead, what's been taking place is that some of the Republicans who have been working on this, the Republican senators like Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia, have been speaking directly with White House officials, with cabinet secretaries like Pete Buttigieg, the, the transportation secretary, or Gina Raimondo, who's the commerce secretary, and kind of going through how this package would be paid for, exchanging ideas, but not handing over a counterproposal per se. Part of the challenge is that it's, it's difficult to get even 10 Senate Republicans on board for one specific counterproposal. And without that, then these negotiations are kind of meaningless because uh, that's sort of the magic number of Republicans that would be needed at the very least to pass something in the Senate. And, and so they've, they've kind of gone this more informal route. But um, you know, it hasn't hasn't necessarily borne fruit yet. The White House isn't giving up. The Republicans aren't giving up. They're going to continue to talk. But this deadline, this informal deadline that has been set by the president, and we've heard it uh, echoed repeatedly by his press secretary and others, is that they are expecting to see what they're calling significant progress by Memorial Day, or the president might choose to go a different route, try to pass this with Democrats alone. And Memorial Day is getting pretty close at this point. Just around the corner. Finally, Anita, the Biden administration announced it will stop using two immigration and customs enforcement facilities. What's the issue? And could we see additional closures? The issue is that, you know, President Biden, when he was not president, when he was campaigning, said he would look at all of these facilities, more than 200 in the United States, that um, house immigrants. Uh, they have had a lot of accusations against them uh, that some of them are not safe or they're mistreating some of these um, immigrants that are, that are housed there. These two particular facilities that uh, he dealt with today, they are... They are stopping a contract. So that's why these two facilities are being closed. We understand that the administration is looking, started with these two particular ones because they had already moved a number, of, a number of the prisoners out. They were had only a few. One has more than 100, one has less than 10. So uh, both of these facilities also face, face investigations into how they are treating or how they have treated people. And so they felt like these were two to start with. But look, the president, the administration is getting a lot of uh, pressure, facing a lot of pressure from some Democrats, uh, progressive groups, groups like the ACLU, who say these are not safe places. They want them to be closed. These, they want these contracts to be uh, stopped. And so I think what this is just the beginning. We're going to see the administration continue to do a wholesale review of all of these facilities and stop and close them or stop these contracts when they can. I think this is just really the beginning. Uh, it's been what, four months now that the administration has been in, and this is one of the issues that they had not addressed, and there was a lot of pressure on the Department of Homeland Security to go ahead and act. All right. Nancy Cortez and Jacqueline Alamany, thanks to you both. Anita Kumar.